Today we are in the card room of the State House and we're looking at um, what is one of our newest groupings of paintings here um, at the beginning of this uh, session. We've taken our um, paintings and etchings from James Franklin Gilman from the um, late part of the 19th century and grouped them all together here. Um, Franklin did a number of State House and sort of Montpelier area uh, paintings, drawings, and engravings uh, during his time in Vermont, which was roughly the 1870s through the 1890s. He was here for about 15 or 20 years uh, and spent a good deal of time here in Montpelier, uh, just down the street from the State House. And what is really great about these is it captures a moment in time uh, before the, the dome was gilded. So um, <clears throat> for those who may not know, uh, when the building opened in 1859, the State House is an Italian Renaissance style building and at the time had a red roof and a red dome as you can see here in these paintings. Um, the idea behind that was as a Italian Renaissance building these uh, great Italian buildings have red tile roofs and it was painted um, to, to mimic that and it wasn't until early in the 20th century that the dome itself was gilded. So um, these capture a look to the building that um, you don't see anymore um, and it, it's really interesting. Uh, we're lucky enough over the years here to have had um, the opportunity to purchase some of Gilman's paintings, to have had the opportunity to have individuals or groups uh, purchase for us or donate to us. Um, so we're really lucky to have a nice little collection here that do capture the uh, late 19th century State House. Now, Gilman came uh, from Massachusetts in 1872 here to Vermont and um, was a pretty uh, itinerant and accomplished artist at the time. Um, he did a lot of paintings around the state here of um, farmsteads and homes and, and things of that nature. A lot of times he would be given uh, room and board in exchange for doing a painting uh, for someone along his travels here through Vermont. Um, he had established himself in the, the mid um, 1880s with a studio on State Street here in Montpelier and was working in a variety of different media uh, at the time. Um, but the ones uh, you may see Gilman's around here and there. Uh, the Vermont Historical Society has a really beautiful one that's very large that has this, the State House with the Red Dome as well. Um, but for obvious reasons, uh, the ones that certainly draw our attention are um, the ones that they do depict the State House. Uh, interestingly enough, these are depicting it from different angles, different places, uh, and for different reasons. We actually have one here that is uh, a black and white uh, etching that actually was commissioned at the time, uh, we're almost certain, by the Catholic Church, which used to sit a two-steepled Catholic Church uh, next to the State House, just down the street here on Court Street. And uh, this was donated to us uh, anonymously a couple of years ago in memory of, of Sue Coffin, the, the um, wife of Howard Coffin. And this is a really amazing piece. We're, we're quite certain that it, it was commissioned for the church because if you look closely at the, uh, the paper it was etched on, uh, that it was done on, there's actually a watermark of the church on there as as well. Um, that's, that's difficult to see unless you get right up against it. So um, a lot of different perspectives, a lot of different reasons, that many that we'll never know why certain paintings were done or who they might have been painted for. But again, in a lot of cases, he was doing um, these paintings not just because of the beauty of the building, but perhaps for someone that was paying him or offering him uh, housing and meals in exchange for his work there. So if you do find yourself in the State House, um, Take a look here in the card room in the corner. I think we've done a, a really great job of, of highlighting um, our collection of Gilman's, and it really does capture uh, a different time period here for, for this great Capitol building of ours. My name is Elizabeth Novotny. I'm the president of the Vermont Bar Association, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Uh, I'd, uh, I'd like to uh, just take a mo moment and talk to you a little bit about the, uh, what is the third annual award ceremony for the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. poster essay contest for Vermont middle school students. Um, we are proud of all of the students who participated, obviously, in particular the three that uh, are featured here today. And we are actually really thrilled because this year we had a record number of submissions. And that's a true testament to the power of Dr. Dr. King and his legacy and his work. And we remain committed to that legacy because justice and the quest for it really is a daily endeavor. Um, I'd also like to take a moment and acknowledge uh, our co-sponsors of this event. Uh, in addition to the Vermont Bar Association, we have the Vermont Bar Association's Young Lawyers Division and the Vermont Bar Association's Diversity Section. 
So in the audience here today, Terry Corsones, our Executive Director of the Vermont Bar Association, Jessica Brown, who's here on behalf of the diversity section, Molly Gray, Vermont Bar Association board member and member of the Young Lawyers Division. Yes, and I just saw that Judge Waples came in the room. Well, Judge, good morning. Good morning. And Judge Nancy Waples, who was the former chair of the diversity section and was chair of the diversity section when this contest uh, was conceptualized and created. Thank you for being here. I know you've come every year. You still remain committed, so thank you for that. Um, and I want to particularly thank all of the folks from uh, the diversity section and lawyers division and from our offices at the uh, Bar Association for their work in creating this contest and supporting it through the years. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> each year, the sponsors of this event select among the many poignant and thought-provoking quotes from Dr. King, one quote. That's actually hard work if you think about it, right? And this year's quote is, true peace is not merely the absence of tension, it's the presence of justice. So congratulations to all of our contest participants and winners who gave life to the meaning of this quote and in so doing, honoring Dr. King and his work. Um, I'm also very honored to have the opportunity to introduce uh, our awards presenter, Governor Phil Scott. Many of you don't know this, but young Phil Scott, in his first year at the University of Vermont, was studying to be a teacher, a technical education teacher. And while his career path changed his commitment to uh, education and Vermont youth and their success, has not. So thank you, Governor Scott, for your commitment to this contest and your support for this as well. Appreciate it. Um, so now I'd like to invite Governor Scott to present the awards. Thank you very much. Appreciate well, thank it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and thank you to the Bar Association uh, for being a sponsor of this event. Uh, we're surrounded uh, here in this room by judges and lawyers, and sometimes that's not always the best thing, but in this case, <laughs> um, it's a good thing. Uh, Judge uh, Joseph, uh, Joseph uh, is here with us as well, a uh, former legislator. Uh, Judge Waples and, and others. Um, you know, we live in a very polarized world. Uh, we don't have to look very far in social media or in the news and, and see how divisive it's become. And I think Dr. King uh, reminds us uh, that we, we can do things differently, but it's up to us to do that, right? We typically look at role models. We look at leaders uh, to be our role models. But in this case today, we're looking at our youth to be our role models for us how we can do things differently, how could we can look at things so that we're not always an us versus them mentality, that we're actually trying to work together towards common causes and to think about things like simple things, like the golden rule, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated, do unto others as you would have done under you. And I think it's really simple when you break it down and think just like that. And Dr. King said you can't fight hate with hate. So what we're trying to do here is trying to to present, trying to, to talk about some of the good things we do in this state, rather than all the bad, and find common goals uh, so that we can all find ways to work together. And, uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's reflective of what we're seeing here today, and wonderful, wonderful work by some tremendous artists uh, here in Vermont. So uh, with that, I'd like to just start with the second runner-up. Sure. Terry, would you like to, to assist here? Yes. Uh, Caitlin DeBonis and Courtney Ezzo, if you would like to come up, Governor Scott would like to present you with your awards. Come right around here. This is the way we do things. Then we can do pictures. There. Do you want others in this picture as well? Oh. Um, well, it's up to them afterwards, and, and if they want to stand me by either side of their poster, if they would like. Okay, let's get right over here. Let's do this differently. Here, I'll come with you. Over here. Okay. If you would like, 
Could you explain what this is about and what inspired you to do this uh, in particular? Um, <laughs> so I'll break it down. So the so Martin Luther King made a big impact on racism, and he showed that there is hope in the world and that things can change. So we wanted to show colors as like the background. We showed colors that kind of we looked up definitions and stuff, and the colors we thought meant like what Martin Luther King was, like intelligent, smart, powerful, and we just went on from there. That's great. Anything get to add to that? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. sat in, which they were, they were four black men sitting in a, at a white lunch counter, and they weren't served, but they didn't move, so that kind of represents the presence of justice, and this is a canon from the end of the Civil War, which means there was like an absence of tension. The Civil War was no longer happening, but there still wasn't justice present. And this is kind of almost a gap in between these two time periods, and then the dove represents true peace, and it's pointing towards the justice, or the presence of justice. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. I have a feeling we might see Elizabeth here in about 10 or 15 years in this very building. Now we go to the first place winner. Great. And we have another team, Governor Scott, um, Nicholas Malazzo and Zachary Davis, eighth graders from Colney High School. And there's pictures first, then we can try it. <laughs> it seems to be a common theme with Pulteney High School. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us about your artwork? So, um, it's like the base, this is the theme we started off. So, uh, this is Martin Luther giving the king, giving a speech. And he's got people in the background that are representing a bunch of things that have to do with like justice, like integrity and like unity and being one. And then we've got a pride flag out in the back. And he's just kind of like showing that we're all one big community and we got to like work together to. And it says down at the bottom here, you have to do stuff about your problems. You shouldn't just ignore them. To keep peace. Well, thank you very much. Anything you want to add to that? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we we talked about their their artistry skills um, before, and uh, and I was telling them that I I can't uh, I can't draw figures all that well. I can do architectural type type of drawings, but uh, but they said that they couldn't do uh, figures either. But I I would disagree. <laughs> it looks much much better than I would do. So, congratulations again. Thank you. <laughs> And Governor Scott, we do a traveling trophy, and, and there's actually a, a one teacher, the art teacher for the, the Pulteney High School, I didn't know if she Not would make it. art teacher. Oh, 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 really? Okay. Well, the uh, English language arts. She was the driving force behind oh. it. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Obviously, they have to be inspired by someone. Um, and, uh, and I thank you so much uh, for taking the lead on this. And, I, and I've said many times, we can all do something uh, to, to promote um, civil rights, justice, uh, and treating each other civilly and respectfully, uh, but it takes leaders like you to do that. So thank you very much for all you're doing. So I'll give they you this traveling. They inspire me all the time. 
anything you'd like to say on behalf of, uh, of your students? And um, uh, well, I, I'd like to thank the Vermont Bar Association. Um, the quote was so uh, deep and inspiring, and uh, the students really um, had uh, a lot of uh, 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 philosophical discussion around these ideas. Um, it is, uh, you know, a very uh, philosophical quote, and uh, they just took it and ran with it. And we had. Um, what did you do? What it. did you do with it? Um, it wasn't just about the artwork, obviously. Right. You had discussions for a number of days, weeks, maybe. Uh, so it nestled really nicely within a unit uh, in which we read "Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry" by Mildred Taylor, and. Um, so we had been studying race, racism, uh, white privilege for a number of weeks leading up to this, and it fit really well into a chapter uh, that um, deals with this idea perfectly, um, that uh, in, in the novel, a white landowner is trying to um, shut down a boycott that's happening, you know, by telling, um, the people of color that, um, you know, we can, this is a peaceful community and we can all just wipe this under the rug. <laughs> um, but obviously there was a lot of tension there and a lot of uh, discord and unhappiness under the surface. Uh, so this fit really well into that. And we read about the bus boycott and uh, so it was pretty naturally um, and organically uh, fit in well. So. Yeah, well, well done. And uh, we thank you all for your thank efforts you. as well. We have a lot of uh, some proud, uh, proud legislators here as well. Um, Patty is from uh, Pulteney, uh, but also Rutland County Senators as well. So thank you very much for coming today. Um, and the families, obviously, for coming uh, and uh, being part of this and being part of this open government that we have here in Vermont. We're, we're pretty unique uh, in, the, in the country. Uh, but this is something that we can lead by example. We can do things differently uh, and be open to different ideas and, and just have the conversation, right? Just, just talk about it. Uh, and sometimes instead of driving something, we have to lead. And, and I believe that, uh, that you're doing so at a young age. So thank you very much for your efforts, all of you, uh, for, for coming and being part of this. all so much for joining us today. I think I know most of you here, but just in case, I'm Joyce Judy, President of the Community College of Vermont. Yay. This year, <laughs> this year, 2020, marks the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Community College of Vermont. As we were looking ahead to this milestone, we had so many questions about how best to celebrate it. Vermont is our campus. We have 12 academic centers across the state. We knew we wanted to hold a series of events in our local communities so students, faculty, and staff could all join in the celebration. We also wanted to hold a kickoff event here in the State House so we could acknowledge and thank the governor, senators, representatives, other statewide officials, and our partners who are so supportive in our work. Following our birthday cake celebration this afternoon, we are proud that a joint resolution commemorating our 50th anniversary will be read in the House Chamber to acknowledge the many ways CCV has served and impacted Vermont these past five decades. But before I introduce our guest speakers, I would like to acknowledge a few others who are in the audience. First, our VSC Chair of the Board of Trustees, Church Hines from Colchester. And I'm going to read the names of all of our other trustees because I know so many of them are here. I think I'd ask you to hold the applause until I get done. Um, Janet Bombardier from Colchester. Megan Kluver from Hinesburg, Representative Lynn Dickinson from St. Albans, Peg Flory from Rutland, Representative Dylan Giambattista from Essex Junction, Izzy Gogardi from Castleton, Adam Grinnell from Wilmington, 
Representative Bill Lippert from Heinsburg, Karen Luno from St. Albans, Representative Jim Maslin from Thetford, Linda Milne from Montpelier, Mike Pichek of Winooski, and David Silverman of Morrisville. Now let's give them a hand. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank um, Vermont State College's Chancellor Jeb Spaulding for coming today. And I am incredibly proud that we have two past CCD presidents with us here today. Our founding president, Peter Smith, and longtime president, Tim Donovan. several philanthropic supporters here with us today, but I want to acknowledge a few of our very longtime partners who have been so supportive. First, the president of the J. Warren and Lois McClure Foundation, Barbara Benedict. And the foundation's executive director, Carolyn Ware. President and CEO of the Vermont Community Foundation, Dan Smith. And President of Forward Philanthropy of Montpelier, Christine Zaki. These partners provide incredible leadership for our mission in Vermont, and they support programs for veterans and active military students at CCD, programs that help us engage middle and high school students so that, they, so that more Vermonters realize the doors that can open by continuing their education beyond high school and that they too can go to college. And they also support a dynamic variety of grants to help us innovate and improve our services for all students. We are incredibly grateful. Many CCD faculty and staff are here this afternoon and I want to thank you all for your incredibly dedicated work. However, I do want to acknowledge that this is the first week of our spring semester, so there are many staff and faculty and students who are not with us today, because this, as you can imagine, is an incredibly busy time. But for those who came, thank you so much. And finally, we are especially glad to have several students and alum joining us today. Thank you for being here to represent the 5,000 CCD students who are enrolled in courses this spring. Students and alums, will you raise your hand so we can acknowledge and thank you. Five decades ago, CCB had very humble beginnings. Governor Dean Davis charged the Special Commission with finding a way to deliver post-secondary education to Vermonters in their local communities. To go to college in Vermont in 1970, you had to find your way to a college campus. And as you can imagine, this made going to college out of reach for so many Vermonters. In 1970, CCD opened its doors with 10 classes and 50 students in Montpelier. If you think our funding is tenuous now, <laughs> back then, CCD was a single line item in the entire state budget. So fortunately, that changed within a few years when CCD joined the Vermont State Colleges. CCD grew quickly, ending up with 12 centers across the state, from Newport to Bennington, St. Albans to Brattleboro. But I dare say, I don't think anyone in 1970 could have imagined that we would become the second largest institution of higher education in Vermont. From the start, CCD has been focused on access. We claim to be within 25 miles of 95% of the state's population. However, if you live in Canaan, it probably does. This does not, <laughs> this does not work, but we, are, we, we strive to serve everyone. We are also the wide end of the funnel, offering a place for students from all backgrounds to enroll in college. From high school students looking to save time and money on their college degree, to the working adult 
who's been passed over for promotions because they lack the credential or degree, to the professional looking to upgrade their job skills, to the veteran looking to transition from military to civilian life, and to, to the new Americans building a new life for themselves and their families. No matter the need, CCV is here for you. In 1996, long before it became a trend, CCV recognized that online learning technology could help more Vermonters access college courses and programs. It took geography out of the equation and gave students with irregular job schedules, transportation, child care issues, access to college learning. We even have many veterans, military students, who are either deployed or waiting to be deployed, enrolled in our online classes, because they can continue their studies while they're overseas. CCV's goal is to be accessible and to prepare students for their next step, whether it is a new job, a promotion, or transferring to a bachelor's program. In the past five decades, 150,000 Vermonters have enrolled in CCV courses. But there is one lesson that we have learned that has made all the difference in how we do our work. A community college must take its name seriously and work together with the broader community to bring our shared resources to the table. We have partnered with four-year colleges and have built pathways and guaranteed admissions programs for students to transfer their CCD courses into bachelor programs within the Vermont State Colleges, <coughs> the University of Vermont, and most of the privates, especially Champlain and Norwich. We work closely with VSAC, the Agency of Education, Corrections, Vocational Rehabilitation, the Department of Children and Families, the Department of Labor, the Department of Commerce, and others to coordinate services and opportunities for students. We have built close connections with high schools and tech centers across the state, with the business community, and with our incredible funding partners. Working together, we strive to meet the changing needs of Vermonters so the credentials and degrees we provide lead students directly to good jobs, self-sufficiency, and financial security but we recognize we cannot do this work alone. Our collaboration works because we all share a core belief that education has the power to transform lives, inspire individuals and families, and strengthen our businesses and communities. We look forward to continuing our work together in the next 50 years to meet the challenges ahead and to build a strong and thriving Vermont. my distinct pleasure to introduce some of our distinguished guests and our first is Governor Phil Scott and I just want to say that this governor never misses a CCV graduation and I can tell you it means so much to our students to have him there to congratulate them from the podium and to have him watch and applaud while every graduate walks across the stage to receive their degree. Governor? Thank you very much, Judy, and uh, you deserve so much credit, credit for your leadership. Uh, it takes that, leading by example, and I think, um, I think we all uh, owe you a uh, debt of gratitude for everything you've done. Um, as well, congratulations to all of you. Uh, you do know how to draw a crowd here. I look around the room, a lot of horsepower in the room, even a former governor in the back. Uh, <laughs> Sure, with all the talent we have in this room, we can solve a lot of world problems today. <laughs> so, CCB is a really important economic development tool for our state and many of our families as well. As was mentioned, I don't miss a CCB graduation, um, and it's very meaningful for me. And no disrespect to UVM or any of the other state colleges at all. But it's been meaningful for me to see, because I'm always so impressed uh, with those Vermonters. 
of all ages, and you can see it. You look right in their eyes, and you can see it. Those who have worked so hard to get a college education, while also balancing work, family, and just life in general. I've seen grandmothers surrounded by their grandchildren, finally taking the time for themselves after spending a lifetime taking care of others. I've also seen 17-year-olds with their proud parents and grandparents watching as they take an early step toward their career. And I've seen those middle-aged Vermonters set an example for their kids, taking the, having the courage to take that risk and make a change to do better for themselves and their families. They are all truly inspiring. That's one reason why my administration has expanded our view of education. So I think it's important to think about things rather than just thinking K through 12. We need to broaden our focus so that we're thinking from cradle to career. And we're doing this because I believe building the best education system in the nation is, uh, is something that we can give to our kids. It's important to our adults and making sure that they get the best education in the country. That's one of the best economic tools we can ever ask for. So with this in mind, we've increased funding uh, for childcare, for instance, by $10 million over the last three years. It makes it easier for parents to get back into the workforce, but also, as in the case for a lot of CCV students, get back to school because they need someone to take care of their kids. And we've invested $5 million, million more in higher education and another $1.5 million five, uh, for career and trades training, but there's an opportunity and a need to do more. And that's why, uh, as I said yesterday in my budget address, I've directed the Department of Labor to work with the state colleges, as well as tech centers throughout the state, to double the number of apprentices by 2023. <laughs> as well, uh, to further increase training, I've asked the DOL and the Agency of Education to work with the state colleges to align our adult education, our adult CTE programs with CCB, BTC, our tech centers, as well as our regional stakeholders. And this will create a, a seamless pathway from school to training to work. It will also help the state colleges uh, specifically um, through the work of CCB uh, to, to expand uh, their reach into our communities, even further expand their reach into their communities. So I want to congratulate uh, CCB and to all the graduates who are here uh, on the 50 years of important contributions to our state, its communities, and families. And I look forward to supporting you in the months and years ahead. So thank you very much. Senator Ginny Lyons to say a few words. Ginny is a longtime CCB faculty member. She's taught courses in nutrition, she's taught courses in environmental science for many, many years, starting in our Burlington Center and now in our Winooski Center. And we are so grateful to Ginny and also to, Rep, uh, to Representative and Trustee Lynn Dickinson for co-sponsoring the CCB joint resolution that will be read this afternoon um, on the House floor. Senator Lyons. Thank you so much, President Judy. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I, I was asked to talk a little bit about the students, not about the faculty. We all know who the faculty are. We work hard to bring the very best information that we can and access to community folks, to our students. But for me, it's not about what faculty know, and it's not about what we bring into the classroom as much as what students take out when they leave. So CCV is so wonderful in terms of, in healthcare we look at access, quality, and cost. Could you say anything more than that about CCV? Access to the very best educational opportunities, whether it's online or in the classroom. It's quality teaching and experiences. Many of us who teach at CCV have had other careers and bring some very common sense on the ground uh, work into the classroom. Students take away low cost, high quality, accessible information. 
I think about some of the students that I've had. Uh, a student who came back from the military was very interested in solar generation, so going into the current environmental issues class, I introduced him to a solar uh, uh, project and, and uh, companies, and now he's working building solar um, installations. He's thrilled. I think of another student who uh, was uh, uh, interested in current environmental issues, and she's in nursing, but she was more interested in public health issues. She came into class, we made some connections for her, and now she's very happy working at our local medical center. Students are, as, as Governor Scott has indicated, our students work full-time on two or three different jobs, and some of you, of you in this room have had that experience. They come into the classroom having just taken their children off or dropped them to, at childcare or at school. Uh, they go out of the classroom to pick up groceries on the way home. They come into the classroom off the bus, the link, uh, what, where, however they get into their, into their um, studies. So we understand that about our students and we want to help them succeed. The, when, when I think, I'm gonna say one more thing, uh, when, when we think about environmental science issues, one of the things I tell my students is, we think about carrots, sticks, and tambourines. Carrots, you know, you gotta do your work or you get a bad grade. Uh, uh, carrots, you, you're gonna get a good grade, we're gonna give you a reward of a high grade, I'm sorry. Sticks, you don't do well, your grade goes down. But no one talks about tambourines, and today is a day of tambourines. <laughs> this is celebration, and I just want to sincerely thank all the folks who are involved with CCV administration, board, and oversight uh, for making sure that, and as we will in this building, ensuring that CCV goes on for another 50 years, so thank you. Thank you, Senator Lyons. And now I would like to introduce um, Representative Dylan G. M. Batista, because Dylan is a CCV alum, and we are always incredibly proud to recognize and celebrate our alums. And as we know, um, Dylan is a representative from Essex Junction, but he also is on the Vermont State College's Board of Trustees. So Dylan has done great things since he uh, um, received his degree at CCV. So Dylan. This thing is on. Um, I know we have cake. I don't want to take a lot of time. Uh, but this is a really important day. This is a day uh, of tremendous honor, I think, for both the faculty and the founders of this institution, uh, but also for all of the students who have had that experience. Earlier, uh, it was noted that the governor attends the graduation down at Norwich that is held each year. That experience of building and finding the dignity that is conferred with a post-secondary degree. You know, I know this experience all too well. I started off my post-secondary experience after dropping out of school down in a Rutland County High School, and it wasn't always easy. It wasn't always easy. And for me, what I found in the Community College of Vermont is what so many others have found. Because it's not just a school, it is a family. It is a family with people at all levels looking out for one another. And you know, if you're a student of CCV, if you've been a faculty of CCV, you know the value that when life happens and you're left in a tough situation, this institution is here for you. 50 years of changing lives. 50 years, so I couldn't help myself. I had to go get my diploma because I want everyone to look at what this means to me. You need to know, this is about changing lives. Let's talk about CCB for a minute. Let's talk about the folks who put this together, who had the wisdom and foresight 50 years ago to make post-secondary education available to students in all corners of the state the foundation of a great society 
was built at that time. And today, we have a task before us because at 50 years in, there's more we can do. And I'm so proud of the collaboration that's going on each and every day at the faculty level with our businesses, with government, trying to be innovative as post-secondary education changes. Real quick, I just want to share one reflection from my time at the community college. Because I didn't just start off in Rutland County at Rutland CCV. I went to Burlington. I went to Winooski. I went to Montpelier. <laughs> took classes online. And in those classes, I met the most incredible faculty. I met the most incredible students. Students who had just come back from war. New Americans. I met folks who were later in life who were trying to figure out a new interest, maybe a new job to reskill and find a new way. And I met the faculty. I can remember their names. Pam O'Connor, who registered me down in Rutland. Jim Blint in Burlington. Shams Mortier in Burlington. I remember them all. And I think about them every day. So as we celebrate this 50th anniversary, let's recognize that we're not just conferring degrees on students, we are changing lives. And for that, I am eternally grateful. So two things, I got two asks here before we wrap up. First, let's give a round of applause to everyone here today who has made this institution what it is at 50 years. Let's give a round of applause. And this is about participating before we get some cake. So we're gonna rock this building here. I just want to acknowledge that we stand here 50 years in. I'm probably young enough where I'll be around 50 years from today <laughs> when we gather in this building to talk about what this institution has done for Vermonters over the last 100 years. That's a moment I wanna share and if we all put our heads together, if we support this institution, and if we give it that push into the future, I'm sure it will be just as bright as today. So let's give a round of applause for the next 50 years. And let's celebrate. Thank you, Representative Jean Batista. And I also, just before we uh, break, I just want to give a special thanks to, again to Representative Dickinson for her work in helping to um, craft the resolution. And she's actually going to um, be instrumental in reading um, and celebrating with students in, on the House floor. So now we hope that you will all join in um, cutting of our 50th anniversary cake. And I hope you'll take a few minutes of conversation because the CCB story is really made up of the individual stories of the tens of thousands of Vermonters who have come through our doors. You have may, may have noticed that CCB students, faculty, and staff here today are wearing a special sticker that says, ask me about my CCB story. I hope you'll take a moment to ask them about that story. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for celebrating. And um, I hope you'll join in, uh, us um, at 1 o'clock um, in the House Chamber. Thank you so much. Jim Douglas in the House of Representatives Chamber in downtown Montpelier at our state capitol. I'm here as I am every year, at least for the last decade, with a group of brilliant Middlebury College students studying about Vermont government and politics. And I don't think we can really learn it uh, the way we need to without actually coming to the State House and seeing the legislature on the day when it's in session. So we're here today. Uh, the one item on the floor of the House uh, will, will be the uh, Budget Adjustment Act. And coincidentally, I recall one other year coming on that same day when it was being considered by the House. A lot of activity in the committees, of course. The governor gave his budget presentation yesterday with some uh, interesting ideas, additional resources for tourism in particular, and some uh, regulatory changes that I, I think and hope will be positive. Uh, but uh, you know the old saying, the governor proposes, the legislature disposes, and the appropriations committees and the rest of the members in the two chambers will decide ultimately what the state budget looks like for the year that begins July 1st. It's also an interesting day because of uh, a couple of exciting events going on. The captive insurance 
insurance industry is here. Uh, the Vermont Captive Insurance Association uh, comes to the State House every, uh, every year for a legislative day. The annual meeting is held in uh, the Burlington area in August. Vermont's the largest uh, domestic um, uh, domicile of uh, captive insurance companies, which are uh, firms that are a form of self-insurance uh, with a tax-advantaged uh, arrangement for, for a lot of big companies. A lot of Fortune 500 companies have their captives uh, registered in Vermont. So that's a big part of our, uh, our economic uh, strategy and a lot of good jobs created and revenue coming into the Treasury. It's also uh, uh, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the Community College of Vermont. Um, hard to believe that a half century has passed since our good friend and former Congressman Peter Smith uh, founded that and became its first president. Um, but it's, um, it's the institution that has the largest enrollment of any uh, school of higher learning in Vermont. Uh, I've always liked CCV because it uh, is so egalitarian. It provides an opportunity for Vermonters um, of, quote, college age, unquote, and beyond that uh, to access uh, higher education that may not be affordable or accessible to them under other circumstances. I attended the graduation almost every year perhaps every year when I was in office, and it's just great to see so many Vermonters uh, celebrating their success. So happy birthday, CCV. Best of luck for the next half century, uh, and we hope uh, well beyond that. Um, there's a second Middlebury class here today, uh, coincidentally, so it's a pretty crowded place. We have um, poster winners from uh, uh, from the um, uh, anti-drug efforts of a lot of elementary schools around the state. I had the chance to visit with them and thank them for their focus on a challenge that's really uh, quite pervasive and troubling to this state and everywhere else. Um, we've been trying to do our best to attack that for some years. Um, it, it's a tough one, um, but uh, we hope that our state and local partners will continue to make a, a real difference in the lives of people who are, uh, uh, are addicted to dangerous substances or, or uh, uh, moving in that direction. So uh, um, the legislature uh, chugs along. Uh, it's a, uh, a good time in the sense that state revenues are, are uh, relatively robust right now, but I, I, I worry that we're on a sugar high uh, in terms of uh, the performance of our tax structure because, as Governor Scott has said uh, as re recently as in his budget address, uh, we have a demographic crisis here. We're an aging state rapidly. Uh, we don't have uh, many young people. Schools are consolidating and closing. Um, employers are looking for workers because our workforce has shrunk over the last decade or so. And um, um, perhaps this is a matter of self-interest, uh, but uh, as we uh, see more and more of our population in the senior category, uh, we're going to need people to take care of us. So we've got to focus on uh, rebuilding that workforce, on making Vermont an affordable place to live. And I know that that's what motivates Governor Scott uh, each and every day when he gets up and, and comes here to work. So a lot of challenges, but uh, it's great to be here in the cradle of our democracy. Hi, I'm Debbie Ingram. I'm a senator from Chittenden County, and I serve on the Health and Welfare Committee and on the Education Committee. So in Health and Welfare, our big issue today was about flavored e-cigarettes, our uh, juuling, um, you know, the, the vaping products. And um, of course, there was a lot of press uh, over the summer and the fall about uh, deaths that were actually caused or seemed to be linked to those products. And um, the the problem with the flavored uh, products is that they really appeal to um, to young people, and um, so there's some that are obviously appealing to young people. Like there's you know candy candy cane flavors and and uh, mango and uh, you know all kinds of things gummy bear that kind of thing, but also menthol f is a flavor which um, which in fact um, cuts down on the um, the scratchiness of the throat. And the coughing, so it makes it, um, you know, easier for a kid to um, um, to not have the harsh effects of of the of the smoking or the juuling, and um, more likely to to get hooked on those products. So we've taken a lot of testimony already, and we're going to take some more about banning those uh, flavors um, outright. <clears throat> and uh, I'm very very interested in that, and um, think that could be a real public health uh, uh, measure. 
Um, and in education, we are uh, looking at a variety of different things, but um, the one that's near and dear to my heart is one that I introduced. Um, it's about universal school meals. And this would um, provide for, uh, it would require all of our school districts to, um, to offer both breakfast and lunch um, to all students uh, every day. And the advantages of this uh, would be that you know, all of our kids would have the nutrition that they need. Uh, I, I know that people realize that a lot of children, unfortunately, are, are food insecure. In Vermont, about 18,000 um, kids are, are uh, not able to get all the nutritious food that they need every day. And so they really look to these meals from the school to, to help them um, function well and learn well. And um, the way it is now, some districts provide it, some don't. Um, you know, we've heard these horror stories from other states about kids getting shamed for, you know, their parents have not been able to keep up with their uh, food bills and so they, they're forced to eat an alternative meal or are told they can't eat at all and that hasn't happened in Vermont but still it's the, the, that shame is there <clears throat> and um, so this bill would um, take care of all of that and just make everybody equal. Um, the um, the cost would be passed on to the school district so it would in fact get folded into you know to the um, the budgets and taxpayers would would ultimately pay for it and it might go into the education fund but we're paying for it anyway some of it comes out of the general fund some some comes out of it the ed fund it's it's a real hodgepodge of what's you know what, what currently is going on and so this will make it transparent and equitable for everybody and um, I'm really excited about this uh, we would be the first state in the nation to, to do this and I think it's it's really important to do for our children so that's that's what I've been up to and uh, thanks for taking the time to watch hi there this is Carrie Dolan I'm from the Washington 7 district in the House of Representatives here in Vermont which represents Warren, Waitsfield, Faston, Moortown, and Duxbury. And I'm here to talk about an important bill, H3, uh, what is it, H683. Now this bill addresses our need to support, preserve, protect our migratory birds. As you may know, last year we heard some very startling news that the, uh, our bird populations aren't doing as well as we would like them to do. In fact, since 1970, something on the order of 2.9 billion birds have um, perished, and we're heading in the wrong direction in terms of our bird population in both species count as well as the number of birds per species. And, uh, and this is very unfortunate. Now, Vermont is situated in, a, in an important location in the Atlantic Flyway. A flyway is the land that, or the, the swath of land where birds migrate between their nesting habitat and their overwintering habitat. And we're in the Eastern Flyway, which is, we share with our Canadian uh, provinces to the north, all through that, that, uh, that coastal Atlantic area, all the way down to Mexico and the Virgin Islands. And what this bill does is recognize how important these birds are. Why do we need to take up this bill now? Well, unfortunately, at the federal level, they've uh, reinterpreted a 100-year-old treaty that we have on migratory birds. Now, this has nothing to do with the birds that we hunt. This is all about the non-gay migratory birds, you know, the ones we love at our bird feeder, the, the sparrows, the nuthatches, the meadowlarks, the um, the warblers, and what uh, and by adjusting that 100-year-old treaty that we have with our neighboring countries, uh, by a reinterpretation of that meaning of that bill, is a weakening of our protections for migratory birds. Now we all love birds, whether we hunt, we fish, we we walk, we um, in the in the wilderness, in our woods. Uh, we all appreciate that music that we hear, not, not to mention what we enjoy outside our kitchen window looking at our bird feeders. And what this does is all it does is reestablish 
the interpretation of existing federal law and p puts that reinterpretation back into Vermont state law. So there's no change in the way we have uh, managed and supported our migratory birds. Uh, it's a, a reestablishment of reinstituting the 40-year-old interpretation of a 100-year-old treaty. So that is Bill 683. I hope uh, uh, we hear from you and your support for this bill, and, uh, and we will do what we can to support our migratory birds. And in fact, the fishing, hunting, and wildlife viewing in our, in our, uh, in our state is substantial. It has a huge economic value, too, by attracting birders. Uh, and wildlife viewers from outside of our state. So this too is an economic driver uh, to uh, support our rural communities and our communities across the state. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Representative Bob Helm. I uh, am representative of Fairhaven, Castleton, West Haven, and Hubbardton over on the western side of the state as you exit out of Vermont on Route 4. Um, Anyways, we're here into the, what is this, the third week, I guess, and uh, we are going to do some work on family leave tomorrow on the floor. We had the Budget Adjustment Act on the floor today, and we'll do it again tomorrow. Everything has to be done a couple times, just a uh, formality, but anyhow, um, yeah, and so that's about it though for right now things are starting to trickle out a little bit but it's going to be another two three weeks before things really fire up which they will um the budget the budget adjustment act was the one of the bills we worked on this morning and we will we are now starting to work on next year's budget and that will take until for the house until someplace mid to late eight, uh, March, um, and then the Senate will get it. And at that point, the Senate will have a lot of it. But anyways, yeah, yeah. Right now, it's still a bit slow getting going, but it will come. So anyhow, that's about all I can tell you for now. It's it's early yet. So thank you. If anybody wants to give me a call, it's eight zero two. Seven seven zero zero two six two. Thank you. Bye bye. Hello, I am Representative Deanna Gonzalez from Winooski, and I represent Winooski and a bit of Burlington. And I am here to talk about uh, fragrances in the state buildings. Uh, I have a bill uh, to study what it would be to uh, create a policy to increase access to public buildings. So there's about 60% of, uh, of us get sick, um, whether um, from fragrances, um, from the chemicals in fragrances, really. Um, those, uh, uh, those folks that have asthma or migraines or chronic health conditions, autoimmune disorders, and the like. And so sometimes folks cannot participate in uh, state government, whether that be here in the state house or that be uh, the, the necessary need of going to the DMV, things like that. And so I have a bill uh, to that proposes to look at what would implementing a no scent policy or a low scent policy. So this is uh, includes just the practices in our state government of what are we clean with, what do we have kind of out in, in public spaces, and then also for folks who are coming in and out of buildings of what uh, the, uh, the chemicals that folks have on their person and, and how that can um, impact and, and um, reduce the ability for some folks to access uh, being part of, uh, of the state. So that's the bill that I have and just wanted to pop on here and say hello and, and say that uh, there's lots of different ways to increase access to our government process and that is one of them. Hi, I'm Representative Robin Chestnut Tangerman, Rutland Bennington District, uh, representing the towns of Tinmeth, Middletown Springs, Paula, Wells, and Rupert. And I just want to touch on two things today, the first being um, unexpected trials and tribulations in the State House, which I discovered um, when I put all my dress clothes in the dryer with a black ballpoint pen. So I'm wearing new clothes today. Uh, we had to go emergency shopping last night, buy new dress shirts, new pants. Um, just something that I never thought about um, with this job. So 
uh, you know, live and learn. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about is um, the, the paid family leave bill, which is up for a vote tomorrow. There's a lot of um, concern in the House. Um, and that, I'm in the middle of that concern because uh, the Progressive Caucus and a few other uh, progressive-leaning Democrats um, have major concerns about the bill. We recognize that the conference committee actually made some good improvements in the bill. They uh, uh, lowered the threshold for qualification. They improved leave times, um, included a study on TDI, um, a num number of improvements. I, I want to recognize the, the work that the committee did. Um, my concern is about TDI, temporary disability income. And that is the insurance program that would cover you when you get sick. Um, currently in the bill there is leave to care for family members or for the birth of a child or adoption of a child. Um, but if you yourself are injured or sick and need to take time off from work, you're not covered in this bill. And that's a significant flaw, I, I believe, because a large number of us have no protection and we live paycheck to paycheck. Um, and so you miss work, you're out for a week, and you have to start making hard choices. There are a lot of Vermonters who are living that way, that tight, that close to the bone. And for this bill not to include that um, temporary disability income is, to me, a serious flaw. There is a, a TDI provision in it as an opt-in but we all know that any broad-based insurance program needs a broad base of support. And opt-in is the worst way to get that support. Mandatory uh, enrollment for a broad-based program is the ideal mechanism. Opt-out is not as good, but still um, better than opt-in. So that's the fundamental concern, is that this bill doesn't provide necessary benefit that a lot of Vermonters would improve lives for a lot of Vermonters at a very minimal cost. The vote, uh, this bill is up on the, the floor for a, a vote in the House tomorrow, uh, a vote on the conference committee bill. So it's a straight up yes or no vote. I intend to vote no. And it's not because I don't value paid family leave, it's because I value it too much. And I think we need to be doing better than we are. And a no vote in the House would not kill this bill, it would return it to the committee, to the conference committee, to be improved. Um, so that is how I intend to vote, and that is why I intend to vote that way. Um, I think paid family leave, I think temporary disability, I think bonding time are critical uh, support structures for a, for a strong and vibrant society, and I support them um, to the bottom of my heart. I think we can do better than we are, and that's what my vote represents, my vote tomorrow. Um, and the, presumably, uh, my understanding is it, is it will still pass, it will go to the governor. Governor, I believe, intends to veto it, which brings up the question of a veto override. And that is a different story, different set of calculations, and the subject of a different video. So thank you.